I, I want to talk about uh, probability a little bit more. And again, just let me remind you, as always, at the beginning of these videos, uh, I'm using a textbook uh, that's either the same exact one that you have, or it may be a little bit different. Uh, again, don't worry about that. It's the same information. Uh, it's just could be uh, updated. We have, you know, sometimes we get to newer versions and we can't redo um, all of the materials and videos all at one time. So, so I try to pick the best one uh, that I have at the time for the video. So, uh, but let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, today we want to talk about the multiplication rule. And you'll see here that they say uh, notation they want to talk about first. And it says here notation P of A and B. And um, it says P, the probability. So P stands for the probability. And then A is event A. Something's happening in a first trial. And event B, so we see B here too. Something else occurs in a second trial. So so we notice that this is referring to two things going on. Now, it could be the same thing. It could be like, oh, I'm going to flip a coin uh, instead of one time when we were talking about the addition rule and using the word or multiplication rule. We identify that here with the and is telling us that that has more than one event. And in this case, you see there's two trials. So the probability of something and then something else occurring uh, would be written like this. So, for example, if I flip that two coin um, two times, I may say, what's the probability of it being heads on the first toss and tails on the second toss? So it would be heads and tails, probability of getting a heads and then a tails. Okay. Now, this notation um, is a little bit different, and we'll talk about why. It sounds like we're talking about the same two things, and we are in some senses, but this is read probability of B, given that A has occurred. Okay, so, so this is a little bit different than what we have written up here again. So we're going to come into this in a little bit, and we're going to talk first about uh, some independence and dependence with trials, and it's very important. And it says two events A and B are independent. If the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other. Okay, so uh, let's go back to that idea of flipping a coin two times. If I flip a coin and I say, what's the probability of getting a heads on the first toss? And then I think, okay, well, you know, we know long run, flipping a coin, you know, the heads in the long run would be one out of two. And um, then we think, well, that coin doesn't change after we flipped it one time or two times or three times or a hundred times in a row. That coin stays the same. It's got two sides and basically... Um, we can toss it and, and we don't, you know, change our sample space. Now, it says, though, here, if we have two or things, there are several events uh, that are occurring, right? If A and B are not independent, they're said to be dependent. So what does that mean to be dependent? Well, we just said that as you go through trials, like rolling a die, if I roll a die, over and over and over again, and it's a six-sided die, and it has the numbers one through six. Those numbers stay there. They don't change. The die doesn't change. Um, we consider that they would be independent rolls. Now, dependent event would be something like you're playing cards. So let's say that you were dealing cards to three people, and you started out with a, a 52 deck uh, set of cards, and um, you start out and you have 52 cards, and then you deal one to the first person. Well, then um, you don't have 52 cards anymore. So now when you deal to the second person, things have changed. The sample space has changed. 
uh, there's only 51 cards left, right? That they have the option of getting. And then they, you give them a card and then you go to the next person. And then it even changed again. So see those trials, dealing a card out, right? To three people out of 52 cards, right? Those are, in, those are dependent events because there's a change going on from one trial to the next. So, so that's what we mean by when we see dependent. Let's say that we were, um, we talked about, you know, selecting coins out of a hat. And um, let's say I was gonna pick twice out of that hat that we were talking about with the red, blue, and green coins in it. And if it had nine coins to start with, uh, I would reach in and, you know, each one individually had a one out of nine chance, even though there's say two blue, that means getting a blue would be two out of nine. But um, if we select it again and we didn't put the coin back in, then we would say that is um, selection without replacement. And that would create a dependent event because we had nine coins to start with and I reach in and I pick one out. Well, now there's only eight coins in there. And again, well, it kind of depends, right? On what the probability of blue is maybe on the second selection, because if I pick the blue on the first one, it would only be one out of eight. Well, if I didn't pick a blue one on the first one and there's eight left, then two blue, there'd be two out of eight. So. So it depends on what happened on the first trial. And that's what that um, notation was before when we were talking about, we said, you know, what does, um, what does this mean? Probability of B given that A has occurred. So what's the chances of getting a blue coin? Well, it depends on what happened when we selected our first coin. And, you know, we, we'll get the dependent events here in a little bit. And um, what I'm gonna do is uh, go to the whiteboard and do a couple problems. And then when we come back, we're going to uh, look at a couple other of these um, terms. So let me just uh, move ahead and then go over to the um, whiteboard. So let's go ahead and take this off. All right, so uh, so again, we're, we're talking about, first of all, in probability, right? The first thing you have to ask yourself in anything that you do in probability, right, is you have to ask yourself um, how many trials, okay, how many trials? And one, we would come over here. And then uh, we could say, well, all right, uh, let's say uh, one, and we come this way, and then we got to ask ourselves again, um, simple, all right, or compound. Right, so, so if it's simple, then we use uh, the basic basic rule for probability when we take what we're looking for divided by the total. So it's creating that fraction where you just take how many things are in your sample space divided by the total number of things in your sample space. Okay. So again, if we have one trial like flipping a coin one time or something, right? And we just want to know probability of getting a heads on that coin toss, then we would say that's just a simple thing. We look at the basic rule. Well, if it's compound, then that's when there's an or, right? Remember that the um, or told us that we needed to use the addition rule. Right, addition rule. So 
how did we know it was compound, right? Probability of, say, getting a five or a six on a roll of a die, right? So the or said we needed that. Well, then when we came down to this addition rule, we actually had to change and look at this and split it up, right? Because then it was a little different. The addition rule was right, very straightforward if they were mutually exclusive. And remember, mutually exclusive means those things could not occur at the same time. And we used probability of A or B was equal probability of A plus the probability of B. Now, if they were non-mutually exclusive, right, then we had to use probability of A or B was equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and, whoops, and B. And we could do and like that, or we haven't maybe got to that, but A and B. So this was like something when we said the problem was about uh, if a number was even or less than six, could you have both of those conditions exist? When we have even numbers, do we have even numbers that are also less than six? Well, yes, the number four is even, and it's also less than six. So, so those are non-mutually exclusive things, and we would have to use this rule here, right? So that's if there's one trial. We got all this stuff we got to think about just if there's one uh, trial, okay? And so I'm going to make some room here. Because now we just figure out some other things, right? Okay, so let's go back up here. More than one trial. Over here, one trial. All right now, so when we get into talking about the multiplication rule, all right, more than one trial multiplication rule. So that's a good news kind of thing. Anytime there's more than one trial, we're going to be using the multiplication rule. Now within the multiplication rule. We said that that we got to break that down and then ask ourselves other things. Okay. Are they independent or dependent? Or dependent? Okay. Now, uh, kind of was like, like the addition rule. There was kind of like some easy things if they were mutually exclusive, it, it made it easier to work with. And then when you have more than one trial, if you have independent events, and again, remember, that really refers to your sample space. Is it pretty consistent throughout? And then you can treat things independently, if that's true. Uh, or is the sample space changing uh, because of there's a depletion of the sample space because of selections, right? So this is sometimes called selection with replacement and then selection with um, no replacement, right, without replacement. Now, the multiplication rule uh, also has one more step here, too. I'm going to look at this independent, dependent. Now, this is straightforward. We're going to multiply things straight up. But over here, we got to ask ourselves another question. Okay, if they're dependent, are we talking about permutations or combinations. Okay. 
different combinations. So permutations is when order matters. Okay, order matters. And uh, you could think of that again, um, if we were selecting people, say, for a, uh, or we're talking about the a, ra a race, like people were running a race. And we said, okay, who was the top three finishers? And, uh, okay, we said person A, B, and C. Person A, person B, and person C. So we have these three people. They were the fastest three people that we got. And then we said, well, wait a minute. We want to know who was first, who was second, and who was third, right? So we're saying order matters. We just don't want those three people in any order. We, we need to know who was first, who was second, or who was third. But maybe in what you were doing was, was they were just, this was a qualifying run, and you just needed the top three people. You don't care who. Uh, came in first, second, and third, you just need the best three people you got, and then they're going to go on into the you know, next level. So combinations, order does not matter. Okay. So over here, we might be talking about, I'll put in parentheses, Okay, arrangements. So you're arranging things, right? Some order. order doesn't matter. What you're really talking about is groupings. Okay, groupings. And then we're going to come back to this a little bit later. And again, we'll see uh, if we can squeeze it in on this video or not. But uh, I want to go back and do some of these independent problems first. So so we're going to focus first on only independent events, independent trials, right? Multiplication rule, which means basically anytime there's more than one trial, right? So let's go ahead and I'm going to clear this canvas. So let's say that we're going to flip a coin two times. And let's say I want to write out the sample space. What could happen on two coin tosses? Well, you could get heads first, heads second toss. Heads first, tails second toss. Tails first, head second toss. Tails first toss, tails second toss. Okay. These are all the things that could possibly occur when you flip a coin two times, right? Okay, so let's say that I wanted to find the probability of getting a tails and then a tails again on two coin tosses. Well, I could look up here again, we occur further store sample space is a listing of all the things that could occur. Now, I could just use this and answer this question. Well, once, that occurs once out of the one, two, three, four things that are in my sample space. So it's a one out of four. And you say, well, okay, why don't we always just do that? Well, listing out the sample spaces uh, can be impossible. We work with all kinds of numbers, not ones and twos and threes. In reality, we're working with hundreds and thousands and millions and sample spaces are millions and billions and trillions. Uh, so the reality of uh, working with probability in the real world is that you can't. There's too many, too many things in the sample space to use this approach. But remember that we're not learning probability theory here. I'm trying to just teach you the things that you're going to need to refer back to once we move on back into the inferential statistics. So this stuff is important. The multiplication rule is very important. We don't get rid of it. Uh, we have to just understand what it is, that's all. Uh, so 
So let's kind of look at this a different way. What does the multiplication rule say? Well, it says probability, let me go over here, probability of A and B is equal to probability of A times probability of B. Okay, so we're going to use our sample space, but not this sample space. See, this was the sample space for two, but you'll notice what's happening over here. You're saying, well, there's two things going on. Well, now what we're doing is we're looking at one thing occurring twice. We're looking at one thing at a time. My original sample space, right? So we're not even going to look at this over here. We're like, ah, okay, that's the sample space way. What I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, my sample space is heads and tails on any given single toss, right? There's my sample space. So I come over here and I say, okay, what's the probability of A on a single, or in this case, heads, right? And um, let's go ahead and I just write that out because it's going to be too confusing if, even for myself. I, okay, so A and B. Let's go ahead. So R, A, and B is the probability of getting a tails and then a tails, which is equal to probability of a tails times probability of a tails. Okay. All right. So what's the probability of a tails? on a single toss, one half, right? Times, what's the probability of tails on a single toss? One out of two, right? One out of two. And then we multiply. And that's how we get to one out of four that we had over here, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. These are independent trials. Flipping the coin, we talked about it. Doesn't really. Uh, change as we go from one trial to the next. So uh, let's look at another example. Let's say let's say that we're going to roll a die two times. Okay. And again, probability of a let's say a five on the first roll and a three on the second row. Okay, probability of five and a three. First row five, second row three. Nine. Well, we know that multiplication rule says that these independent events, yes, the dice doesn't change as we keep rolling it. So we could look at this as the probability of a five times probability of a three. And what's my sample space for one coin toss? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So the probability of a five is one out of six. Probability of a three is one out of six. And one out of 36. So here's, here's what we want to focus on. And yeah, this is nice rules. It's independent events. We got some new terms. We got to remember. But this 36, you notice that the answers we keep coming up are one over something. Well, this denominator tells me the size of my sample space, right? So yeah, this is the sample space on a single roll. Right. So let's see, we break problems down in probability. We take and we break them apart and look at them one step at a time. This is that. But what's my sample space for the original problem? Probability of five and a three. Well, it's got 36 things in it. One, 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 two, one, three, one, four, two, one, two, 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 three, and so on. And three, one, three, 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 six, one, six, two, you know. So we'd have to list out all 36 things to have our sample space and would find out that a five and a three would occur one time out of the 36 things that are in that sample space. Okay. All right, again, 
pretty straightforward. So let's let's go ahead and move up a little bit. We always keep trying to increase that complexity. And this works with sample spaces that are different but consistent. And I'll tell you what that means uh, in a minute here. Let's take a look at this. Uh, let's say that we're going to answer five questions. Okay. So you're going to guess at them. We're going to randomly pick, say you didn't study for a quiz or something, and you're thinking, what's my chances of getting them all right, Kay? Now, first of all, I need to know what kind of questions they are. So let's say there are three of them are true, false. Okay, three are true, false. Two, multiple choice a b c d e all right all right so i'm going to answer five questions so what would be the probability and and when i do these videos too you know if you want to try them before i give you the answer uh you know stop the video right? try them see if you get this for example this one this is a little bit harder than the last one even though we do it exactly the same it's a little confusing. We got five and two and three, and then it's true, false, some are multiple choice. Are they independent or dependent? Well, they're independent because, again, if I answer true to the first question, does that say change the second question? True, false? It's still true, false. And the third question is still, doesn't matter what I answer on the first question, it's not going to change any of these other options and the next questions, right? If I answer the first multiple choice question B, well, on the next multiple choice question, I still have A, B, C, D, E to pick from. So that's what I mean by consistent. Yeah, we changed from true, false questions to multiple choice. That doesn't make a difference. The options on each question, right, are consistent with the type. All right, let's get to this. So I have how many things occur? five five questions that means five trials so i have five trials like flipping a coin five times is five trials one two three four five trials and i want to look at them all individually these are all going to occur in sequence i need to use the multiplication rule here first question let's say is true false i guess at it my odds of getting it correct one out of two, because it's either going to be true or false. I'm going to pick one of those, right? Second question, it's a true false. It's going to be one out of two. And the third question, one out of two chance of me guessing, right? I'm going to get correct. So those are the first three. And then the next question I go to, well, this two, I don't, it doesn't matter. It's just this one question I'm looking at. I don't care if there's two multiple choice. I only look at these one at a time, right? This is my options, right? I'm going to pick one of them, but there's five choices. I go to the next question. I'm going to pick one of those things in there. Out of the five, it gives me one out of five chance. Then when I put this all together, I multiply, right? Eight times 25, is that one out of 200? So again, what's important to us is, yeah, we look at the answer again, the numerator was one. A lot of times the problems when you think about it, you look at them, you're thinking, if I'm looking for one thing, the well, numerator is probably one. I just need to know how big of a sample space is there to find my probability. So it makes the problems a lot easier if you can set them up where the numerator is going to be like one or some very simple number that you can calculate and then try to work on getting the correct numbers for the sample space. So this means that there are 200 different ways you can answer those five questions. Just five questions with three true false, two multiple choice. I have 
200 different ways. That means I only have a 1 out of 200 chance of getting them all correct by guessing my way through that. So it sounds like a lot, but that's really, you know, true for that problem. So the um, multiplication rule, again, is um, pretty straightforward when the problems are independent. And uh, you have to really um, remember um, multiplication rule means there's more than one trial. If things don't change as you go through, you know, consistently, if you're not losing items, you, um, you know, pretty good idea that it's independent. And then uh, you have, uh, you know, want to break this thing down and then multiply at the end, right? You're going to do your multiplication at the very end once you get all the pieces together. So it's important to know the number of trials, in this case, five questions. And this is always an important number for us so we know how big our sample space is, right? And the interesting part about probability, though, it, it's kind of, you know, makes it more complicated. Is that there are some problems we're going to run into, in fact, later in this chapter. The problems are both independent and dependent at the same time. Those are the ones that get really confusing. So we have independent separately, dependent separately, and then ones that are both independent and dependent. Okay. So let me uh, clear this out. And I'm going to get back to our ebook here. If I can get a hold of that, bring that back in. And he gives rationale for the multiplication rule. And he gives a, a couple kind of, you know, answers here. But uh, what I want to show you, though, is the tree diagram. And this is a, a simple way to kind of look at, you know, how this thing flares out very quickly from trial to the next trial. And so what I want to show you again, here's here's just, you know, true false, right? So that's pretty straightforward. That's one or two. One, you can go this route or this route on true false question. But then the next question is A, B, C, D, E, right? So that one flares out like that. And then this is just two trials. We got either true or false. The next question is A, B, C, D, right? And so you got 10 different things, and he shows you how you would go through and write all those. And that problem we did, remember, had five things. We had true, false. We had a true, false again, and a true, false, and the two multiple choice. So our tree diagram would have gotten very big, or it would have been as big as our page here uh, very quickly. So you don't see people doing probabilities like that. It's just to kind of give you a visual idea when you go from one trial to the next, how these things flare out very rapidly. Just on two questions, look all these different things that occur. But the key for this is to remember, when you're setting up designs, and that's the reality, you don't go out there and do these simple flipping coins and rolling of die and you know multiple choice questions. That's not reality, that's not statistics. And that's not what you would do in probability and how you would um, calculate probability. So we're just doing a very quick chapter uh, trying to come up with some ideas. Now we have an addition rule, multiplication rule, very important. And this is also an important idea. Those sample spaces got very large very quickly. That also happens when you design a study. You need to make sure you understand if you're throwing in more variables into a study and you're looking at things that go from step to step to step and you have a number of those steps in your process, you're complicating the results, the possibilities that are going to be in your list of results dramatically. Very quickly, uh, your study can get out of hand. So you want to think back to something like this and think, you know what, the simpler the studies, the better. That is always true. 
a lot of times people think, oh, we want to do as much as we can. And then they end up really not getting any good information out because they make the study too complicated. And then when they get to the end, they wonder why they don't really understand what's going on. So, okay, so that's, again, section um, 4.2. And we wanted to finish that up. The um, next thing we're going to, I'm going to do some shorter videos. So we're going to stop this video now. And then we're going to continue on uh, with some other problems uh, in the, uh, again, with the dependent probabilities on the next one.